On a hot summer evening in 1943, we were once again in close proximity to the front. The Russians had recently taken Belgorod and had set up positions on the outskirts of the city in our former trenches. The front line through Belgorod, the front stretched from Kharkov to Kursk, was quiet for the time being. The campaign, which had continued almost without interruption since our retreat from the belgorod voronezh kursk triangle, was draining the last of the strength from both sides. The Russians were burying the dead, who were innumerable, and preparing a new powerful offensive on our positions, scheduled for September. After the massacre at Slavyansk, Kharkov remained in our hands, and the Russian breakthrough on the southern front was stopped near Kremenchug. The Soviet troops, having licked their wounds, drove the Germans and Romanians out of the Caucasus and the Kalmyk steppes. They drove us out of the Seversky Donets as well. Nevertheless, they have not yet fully mastered the situation. Taking powerful counterattacks, we could break their offensive. Such cities as Belgorod, Kharkov and Stalingrad appear in all accounts of German counterattacks. 60,000 soldiers took part in the Battle of Belgorod. One of them was me. 18,000 Hitler youth recruits arrived from the camps in Silesia. Their baptism of fire took place in an unequal battle. A third of these boys lost their lives. I remember their arrival very well. They marched in columns and were ready for anything. Some platoons carried banners on which stood out the golden letters of the inscriptions, Young Lions or The World Belongs to Us. Platoons of machine gunners appeared at the front. Infantry regiments with ammunition pouches full of cartridges and grenades hanging from their belts. Motorised brigades with all their heavy equipment. There were soldiers everywhere, and for the next three or four days they kept arriving. Then everything went quiet. We were assigned to regiments, units and companies, each of us being given a precise place of assignment. We had no idea of the impending attack, but we participated in the preparations for it, thinking that we were doing normal military work. As in the past, my companions and I became errand boys. We remembered our former days of study. It was stifling heat. The dry yellow grass of the steppe did not hold back the dust. The slightest breeze made it fall asleep in our eyes. In the evenings, we made fires, talked or sang songs. There was plenty of time to write to Paula, and now all I could think about was her. One evening we were rounded up and given ammunition. Each soldier received 120 rounds of ammunition and four grenades. Ten men, nine soldiers under the command of an officer, made up the offensive detachment. The machine gunner was Gals. Besides him there was another soldier at the machine gun. We received a rifle, two other grenadiers, automatic rifles. In addition, we were loaded with boxes filled with grenades. In complete silence, taking all precautions, we made our way to a shelter close to a large farm, just in front of the front line. The armoured brigade of the Greater Germany Division was nearby. Tractors had brought in tiger tanks and heavy howitzers. They were camouflaged with real and artificial leaves. We checked in with a clerk sitting at a desk. At another desk, a lieutenant was studying a map. He was surrounded by tank officers and field officers. At the edge of the woods I saw wide communications trenches that led to the front line. I think we all had the same thought. This is it. It has begun. All around, other units were taking up positions. We, a platoon of the 5th Company, were directed along a communication path that curved at right angles. The trench led to low shrubbery. The sappers had to sweat a lot while they dug these bends. Everywhere, soldiers from different units, they were deepening and improving the dugouts. It was six o'clock in the evening and the heat of the day had subsided. We got out of the forest by a trench and walked along the tree-lined hills. The officer who kept his eyes on the map showed us the way. We turned to the right and were again under the trees. It was still hot. Soldiers were crowding everywhere. They were looking for positions. At last we came to a dugout crowded with young Hitler youth soldiers. Freeze! shouted the officer who was leading us. Here you will divide into groups and take up your positions as ordered. The field officer will tell you what to do. He saluted and left us with the Hitler youth guys, who were sitting on the ground or squatting and chatting merrily. 
I went to Gals, who put down the MG-42 and wiped the sweat from his face. Damn it, he cursed. They should have left me the rifle. That machine gun weighs a ton. I'm with you, Gals. I think we were assigned to the same platoon. We compared the palms of our left hands. Both bore the stamp. 5R8, which meant 5th Company, 8th Platoon. What is this? asked Olensheim, who came up to us. Our squad number, Sergeant, Gals explained. If you're not in the 8th, we don't know you. Olensheim looked apprehensively at the palm of his hand. Oh, shit. I'm in the 11th. You don't know what our mission is. Not me, said Gals. Ask Corporal Lenson. He'll know what's what. We're going on a picnic, Lenson laughed. He was not happy. His rank did not yet give him access to the secrets of the gods. A guy from the Hitler Youth came up to us, lovely as a ripe young lady. Do Russians stick together in battle? He asked, as if he were asking a question about the enemy's soccer team. You bet he did. Gals resembled an elderly lady in the living room. You seem to have experience, so I asked. The boy excused himself. We were all about the same age. I'll tell you what, young man, said Lenzen. There must be at least some benefit from a promotion. Shoot the first Russian you see and don't hesitate. There are no greater scoundrels than these Russians in the world. Are the Russians going to attack? Olensheim turned white. Undoubtedly, we attack first, said the fellow with the face of Madonna, who could hardly be imagined as cruel. He turned back to his comrades. Do you think they'll tell us what's going on? Lenson spoke loudly so that he could be heard by the paramedic. Shut up, said a veteran stretched out on the ground. When they put lead in your ass, then you'll know. Hey. The Hitler Youth soldier couldn't let those words pass his ears. What kind of bastard talks like that? You'd better be quiet, suckers, the veteran muttered. Compared to us, he seemed like an old man. He was already in his thirties, so he had been enduring the hardships of war for several years. We'll hear more of you when you get your first batch. A soldier from the Young Lions squad stood up and approached the veteran. Perhaps, he said in the confident tone of a student of law or medicine, you will explain your defeatist mood, which is undermining everyone's morale. Fuck you, he said. The kid's colourful speech didn't move him at all. I'm afraid I must insist on an answer, the young soldier persisted. I told you, you're a herd of sheep. Until you get a kick in the teeth, you won't start thinking. Another Hitler Youth soldier jumped at the veteran like a stung man. He was sturdily built, and his eyes were the colour of steel, and his determination was unstoppable. I thought he was going to throw himself at the veteran, who didn't even look in his direction. You say we're Mama's boys? His voice was as imposing as his looks. We've been in training for months, so you're not the only tough one. We've all been tested for endurance. Rumour. He turned to his comrade. Hit me. Rimmer jumped to his feet, and his hard fist drove into his friend's face. He staggered from the blow, and then came toward the veteran. Two streams of blood trickled from the young lion's lips and ran down his chin. And I'm not the only one who can take a punch. To hell with you, the veteran said. He decided it wasn't worth it to get into a fight just before the offensive began. You're all heroes. He turned and started whistling. Why don't you write a letter to your family instead of clinging to each other? Suggested the field sergeant. They'll start collecting the mail soon. That's not a bad idea, said Gals. I'll write to my parents. In my pocket was a letter to Paula that I'd been carrying around for days, unable to finish. I added more tender words and folded it into a triangle. Then I started the letter to my parents. As soon as it gets scary, we all think of our parents, especially our mother. The nearer the hour of onset got, the more afraid I became. I wanted to tell my mother how I felt in a letter. Face to face, it was always difficult for me to speak frankly with my parents, 
to confess to them even the smallest offences. I was often angry at them for not helping me, but this time I was able to express my feelings. I bring my letter in its entirety. My dear parents, especially my mother, you are probably scolding me for not writing you enough. I have already explained to Dad that we live here in such a way that there is no time for letters. I lied a little. I wrote to Paula twenty times, and to my parents only once. But finally I decided to apologise to you and tell you how I live. I could write to you, Mother, in German. I have made great progress in it. But French is still a little easier for me to write. My life is bearable. I finished my retraining and became a real warrior. I would like you to see Russia with your own eyes. You can't even imagine what a huge country it is. The wheat fields around Paris are nothing compared to what we see here. It was terribly cold in the winter, and now it's extremely hot. I hope we won't have to spend another winter here. You can't imagine what we've been through. Today we came up to the front line. It's quiet so far. It looks like we've been moved here to help our comrades. Gals remains my best friend. We have fun together. You'll meet him on my next vacation. I think you'll like him. Or maybe the war will be over by then and we'll return home safely. Everyone is sure. The war is over. It can't go on like this. We can't take another winter like this. I hope my brothers and sisters are okay and that my little brother doesn't spread too much about what's happening to me. I can't even tell you how much I'm looking forward to seeing them. Daddy told me how hard life is for you. I hope it's a little easier now and you're not so needy. You don't have to deprive yourself of everything just to get me a present. I have enough to eat. Mummy, soon I will tell you about a wonderful thing that happened to me in Berlin. In the meantime, I want to tell you once again how much I love you all. I folded the letter and together with a message to Paula, handed it to the letter carrier. The letters were also given to Gals, Olensheim, Krauss and Lenzen. That summer evening in 1943, all was quiet. In the darkness, however, there are clashes between patrols. But what can you do? That's war. The soldiers brought dinner. A little later we ate. We were forbidden to touch the canned food from the inviolable reserve. We had no other supplies. Dusk was approaching when a field officer from our platoon called us to him. He explained what we were to do. On a large map of the area showed us the points to be occupied with all precautions. Under orders we must be ready to cover the infantrymen who would first level with us and then march forward. He named the places of assembly and pointed out other details which I did not fully understand. Then the field felon advised us to rest. We would not be needed until midnight. Did We stood and looked at each other for a long time. Now everything was clear. We would take part in a full-scale attack. We all had a bad feeling in our faces. Someone would not come back alive from the battle. Even in the army of the victor there are dead and wounded, so said the Führer himself. But none of us could imagine ourselves in the place of the killed. Of course someone would die, but I would only be present at the funeral. Even though there was no doubt about the danger, no one could imagine that he would lie mortally wounded. It happens to other people. It happens to thousands of other people. But not to me. We all thought just like that, despite the fears and doubts that tormented us. Even the Hitler Youth soldiers, who had spent years cultivating their readiness for self-sacrifice, could not imagine that in a few hours one of them would not be alive. One can serve an idea built on logic and prepare for great risk, but it is impossible to believe that the worst will happen. And so the night came. After the stifling heat of the day, it brought a coolness. Where there was no war, people must have stretched out on the grass in front of their houses and talked with friends, enjoying the weather. Often, when I was young, my parents and I would take a walk before bedtime. My father believed in enjoying those summer evenings as much as possible and kept me outdoors until my eyes began to close on their own. Gals made me come down from the clouds to the ground. Sire, buddy, be careful when the fighting starts. It's stupid to get killed just before the war ends. Yeah, I said. Stupid. We all had the same thoughts. It was impossible to talk. 
we were all preoccupied with one question. Will I come back from the battle? Somewhere in the back of the dugout, one of the young lions was playing the harmonica. His comrades were singing along. We jumped up at the sudden burst of a shell. Here it comes, everyone thought. But it's all gone quiet. Lenzen approached us. The first Soviet front line is less than 400 metres from here, he explained. The field officer just told me, it's right next door. But not too close, said the veteran, who was not involved in the argument. At least we'll sleep in peace. At Smolensk, the Ivans dug trenches within grenade-throwing distance. Everyone was silent. I'm in command of the 6th platoon, Lenson said. I need to get right under Ivan's nose to stall the movement when the main force starts advancing. Can you imagine? And we're going to have to do the same, said the paratrooper who had been assigned to lead our platoon. I hear that we will come right up to their positions, and here we were praying that we wouldn't get too dangerous a mission. But the Russian scouts will surely notice us, Lindbergh cried in horror. Yes, this will be the most difficult part of the operation. We can only hope for a dark night. We've been told not to fire until the attack begins, so we can get close to the enemy positions without being seen. Don't forget the mines, said the veteran, who had no intention of sleeping. Soldiers from the penalty battalion checked the approaches. They did their best. Now that's what I like, hummed the veteran. Anyway, when you see the wire, don't pull it. If you don't shut up, Lenzen said threateningly, you'll fall asleep before the attack. He shook his hard fist in front of the old soldier's nose. The old soldier grinned but remained silent. And what if we run into an Ivan? Grenadier Krauss asked. Then we'll have to use weapons, won't we? Only as a last resort, answered the Fieldfelder. The idea is to attack them suddenly and eliminate them without any noise. Without any noise? How's that? Shall I hit him with the butt of a gun or hit him with shovels? Gals asked worriedly. Shovels, bayonets, anything. We have to get rid of them, that's all, without raising the alarm. Let's take them prisoner, muttered young Lindbergh. Are you crazy? said the field officer. The unit cannot take prisoners during the offensive. What are we going to do with them? Shit, said Gals. Do we have to kill them? What, are you scared? Lenzen asked. Not at all. Gals wanted to show he was a real man, but his face turned white. I looked at the paddle hanging from my best friend's belt. We had to stand up to let the captain and his company through. And at what point exactly are we? Young Lindbergh asked naively. In Russia, the veteran replied, but no one laughed. The field feeble explained that we were three miles northwest of Belgorod. I'm going to bed, said Gals, stammering. He was not comfortable with all these preparations. We lay down next to each other without even laying out our sleeping bags. The metal of the machine gun that Gals had muzzled in the trench gleamed in the darkness. Sleep did not come, not because we could not sleep in the open air in all our gear. We had slept that way more than once, but because we were worried about the future. To hell with you, I'll sleep when I'm on the other side of the world, said Grenadier Krauss at the top of his voice. He got up and began to urinate against the wall of the trench. I lay awake for a long time, thinking and thinking. Finally, I fell into a deep sleep and slept for three hours. I was awakened by the distant noise of an engine. My movement woke up Gals and Gumpers, another Grenadier, who lay beside me and laid his head on my shoulder. What else is there? He whispered in a sleepy voice. I don't know. I thought we were being called. What time is it? Gals asked. I glanced at the watch I'd been given at school. Twenty minutes past three. And when is it light? Asked young Lindbergh, who had not slept a wink. It must be early this time of year. The engines were still running. If these drivers don't shut their cars up, they'll wake up all the Russians. We tried to sleep again, but we couldn't. Half an hour later, some sounds were heard outside the dugout. Since it was dark, we assumed it was soldiers gathering their belongings. We turned that way to see what was going on when a field officer appeared. 
Platoons eight and nine? he asked, lowering his voice. In place, answered the platoon. Come out in five minutes and proceed to your assigned positions. Good luck. We immediately put all our thoughts behind us, and our minds went blank as if after anaesthesia. We all took up our weapons, checking that our equipment was properly secured, as Captain Fink had taught us, especially that the straps holding the helmet on were properly fastened. Gals shouldered the machine gun, and Lindbergh, his assistant, squeezed in front of him. Only the veteran, the second machine gunner of our platoon, acted as if he had forgotten what was ahead of us. He was in no hurry, unlike the others. He had been in this kind of trouble before, so he leaned the heavy machine gun against his leg and waited for the order to move. I hope you're okay, the veteran turned to his machine gun with a sardonic chuckle. Eighth platoon, called out the field fleeble. His voice sounded as if he had received an electric shock. Follow me and be quiet. Me. We got out and, keeping together, marched along the trench to the forward positions. A field felon led the march. In front of him came Grenadier Gumpers, 22 years old, then Gals, who had just turned 18, and Lindbergh, who was not even 17. Then three machine gunners, a Czech, whose age was difficult to determine and whose name was impossible to pronounce, a native of the Sudetenland. I was followed by the veteran and his aide, another frightened boy. At the end of the procession was Kraus, who was in his early twenties. We walked in the correct order, as we had been taught in the camp where we had to sweat a lot. Sounds were heard, but whether they came from the Russian side or from the German side was not clear. We passed several trenches crowded with soldiers still asleep in the warm summer atmosphere, and at last in the middle of the woods we got out of our trench. Young Lindbergh, loaded like a donkey, stumbled as he climbed up, the machine gun magazines he was carrying hitting each other. The field feeble grabbed him by the straps and helped him out, then looked at him angrily and kicked him in the shin. One by one we reached the edge of the forest. Suddenly, the paramedic stopped and we almost crashed into each other. It's darker here than the underworld, the veteran whispered to me. It seemed to me that our guide, having signalled us to stop, continued to go forward himself. We waited for a new order. In spite of our attempts at complete silence, the weapon still made a few metallic sounds. The Feldfebel returned and we set off again. We reached the trenches at the edge of the forest, where the scouts were already waiting for us, lurking like snakes. We went down into their small trench. Lie down on the ground, the Sudetan whispered to me, who was basically walking ahead of me. Tell the others. One by one we left the last German positions and crawled across the warm ground in no man's land. I kept my eyes on the nailed boots of the Sudets, trying not to let him out of my sight. From time to time I saw the silhouette of a comrade who had to climb over some obstacle. Sometimes the toes of the boots of a soldier who was crawling in front of me suddenly stopped a centimetre from my nose. Then I was terrified. Suddenly the soldier lost sight of the one ahead of me. But in a moment he was on his way again, and my confidence returned to me. I was not alone. At such times, even those who are inclined to think, all thoughts fade from their minds. Nothing seems to be more important than a dry stick that has struck you in the stomach and which you must throw away without making a noise. Your senses are heightened to the utmost, and your heart is beating so hard that it is about to jump out of your chest. We were moving like turtles through the Russian land that we had grown quite tired of. We had to crawl across a strip of sand on which we could be perfectly visible. We ducked under some thorny curly stalks, which at first we mistook for Russian wire. Then we came to a swampy ravine and here halted. Feld Fable, who was perfectly oriented on the terrain, once again replayed in his head the path we had travelled, trying to understand where we were at the moment. The smell in the ravine was like a plague barracks. When we set off again, I was startled to see two motionless figures lying on the sand two metres to our right. I pushed the veteran under my elbow and pointed them out, but he looked on and turned away indifferently. 
With horror, I realised that there were two corpses in front of us, and we would leave them to rot until they were buried in a mass grave. I had the impression that we were crawling into China. Half an hour had passed since we had set out when we first came in sight of the wire stretched by the Russians. Each of us waited with a clenched heart for the advance scout to open the way for us. Whenever we heard the wire being cut, we expected that a mine was about to explode and a cloud of smoke to appear. Sweat streamed down our soot-covered faces. While we were sneaking under the Soviet wire, making no more than 15 metres an hour, we must have aged several years. We stopped for a moment and came together. There were some sounds coming from the Russian forward positions. We looked at each other and realised that each of us was experiencing the same feelings. Another 20 metres we crawled through low shrubbery and grass. We heard voices. Now there was no doubt. We had reached the first line of Russians. Line of Suddenly a barely visible figure appeared, a Soviet scout leaning over the trench where his comrades were. We held our breath and slowly raised our weapons, looking at the field feeble, who froze in suspense and at each other. That look was hard to explain. The Russian went in our direction, then came back. The field feeble drew a knife from behind his belt. Its blade flashed for a moment, and then he slowly stuck it into the ground in front of Gumpers, pointing his finger at the Russian. The grenadier opened his eyes wide and looked from the knife to the lieutenant in horror. He waved his hand impatiently, and Gumpers grasped the hilt of the dagger with a trembling hand. With a mute plea, the grenadier crawled forward. We watched his movements with fear and clenched our teeth tighter to keep from screaming. Then he disappeared into the darkness. The Russian continued to talk peacefully with his friends as if the war was a thousand kilometres away. He took a few more steps. New voices were heard in the distance. For a few seconds that seemed like an eternity. Each of us seemed to forget our existence. The Russian went to where Gumpers lurked and turned. At that moment a second figure appeared behind him. It was Gumpers, who in one leap had crossed the four or five metres that separated him from his victim. The Russian turned around. We heard a muffled shout and the sound of a struggle. From a trench a little farther away came the voices of the Russians. Then we saw the figure of our grenadier rolling on the ground and heard him shout, Friends, help! The Russian jumped aside. The sound of a machine gun cut through the night. To my left another machine gun started firing. Its bullets caught up with the Russian, who fell into the trench. Frightened voices were heard. Germans! Germans! Making a throw that I didn't think he was even capable of, the veteran threw a grenade with his right hand. For two or three seconds it disappeared into the darkness. Then a bright light flashed in the trench and several shrieks were heard. Once again there was silence. We moved away as quickly as possible, keeping parallel to the wire. A noise was heard behind us. At the risk of being hit by a mine or a bullet, we took cover behind a hill and, barely catching our breath, tried to take up a defensive position. Idiots! yelled at Kraus and the veteran. Did I give the order to open fire? We'll never get out of here now. He was just as afraid as the others. But Gumpers asked for help, Field Flebel. Kraus excused himself. He was in a jam. A moment later the flashes of tracer bullets and flares made the surroundings bright. The Russians were firing continuously and throwing grenades at random. We're done, young Lindbergh almost cried. Quick, get the shovels, shouted the Sudeten man. We must dig in or they will kill us. Nobody move, commanded the veteran. We were so afraid that we obeyed him without saying a word. His voice sounded more confident than the field officers. We were completely frozen, even afraid to blink. The flash again. Everyone who was not lying face down on the ground became visible to the smallest details on the battlefield. The corpses of Gumpers and the Russians spread out before us, and five or six more lines of trenches were arranged in front of the wedge-shaped infantry positions. Other flashes illuminated the edge of the woods from which we had come. Fortunately, the Russians who were closest to us didn't see anything behind the hill that covered us, but the soldiers in the farther positions that we spotted in the flashes could see us, and they did start throwing grenades, which the Russians did quite well. Jesus, 
the veteran said. If they hit us, we're done. Let's dig a foxhole, Lindbergh snivelled. Oh, shut up. You can dig with your belly if you want to, but leave the shovels alone. If we play dead, maybe they'll think we are. On the other side of the hill, something fell with a thud. From the top, the ground sprinkled down on us. There were no new flashes, and the flares that had already fallen were fading. The Russians shouted some curses. Somewhere to the left, another grenade exploded. We heard through the noise of the explosion how the fragments were flying. A groan sounded next to the veteran. Quiet, hold on, he said through gritted teeth to his partner. If they hear a single sound, we're finished. The boy clutched his face, twisted in pain. His hands were shaking. Be quiet. The veteran put his hand on the soldier's elbow. Be a man. Grenades were exploding all around. The veteran's partner clenched his fists, his eyes filled with tears. He sniffed his nose. Quiet, the veteran whispered again. The rockets on the ground had finished burning, and it was dark around us again. The Russians had discovered another German detachment to the north of us. Now it was his turn to get his share of bullets and grenades. Several Russian soldiers crawled parallel to our position. Cold sweat trickled down our backs. A veteran held a grenade ten centimetres from my nose. We froze. The Russians got as far as the wire and then turned back. We sighed again. The wounded soldier buried his face in the ground to muffle his moans. They're as shaken as we are, said the veteran. They're ordered to crawl here and find out what's going on. They go a little way, and then they run back as fast as they can and report that they saw nothing. It's almost dawn, whispered the field fleet. I think we'd better stay here. I don't think so, Field Fleur. We better get the hell out of here. Maybe you're right. You. Feldfeeble pointed to Gals. There's a trench about twenty metres from here next to the wire. Get over there. Gals and Lindbergh slid in a crawl in the direction indicated. Where did it go? The veteran asked the wounded man, touching his shoulder. The boy raised a face smeared with mud and tears. I can't move, he said. It hurts here. He touched his thigh. It's been hit by shrapnel. Don't move. We'll send help. OK, the guy said and ducked back into the dirt. Our troops should be here in ten to fifteen minutes if all goes well, said the Feldfeeble, looking at his watch. Dawn is breaking on the horizon. Soon the sun would rise. We waited feverishly. Isn't there going to be an artillery drill at the beginning? We'll be lucky if she's not here, the veteran said. It won't be any easier for us than it is for the Evans. There will be no artillery preparation, the sergeant explained. The first squads are to attack the enemy unexpectedly. We were sent to neutralise his defences. But our soldiers might mistake us for Russians and slit our throats. It's not impossible, the veteran grinned we could hear the voices of the Russians. It was so audible that it seemed as if we were sitting next to them in the trench. They're not worried, the Czech remarked. What's the use of worrying? In an hour we'll be on the other side of the world anyway, the veteran said as if he were thinking out loud. It was getting light fast. We could already distinguish the Russian infantry in the crosshairs of the veteran's machine gun, and below, on the left, a motionless grey mass. It was Gals, Lindbergh, and the machine gun lurking. You boy, the veteran turned to me. You're going to take my partner's place. Come here, lie down on my left. Now, I said, and crawled in the direction indicated, having in a minute with my nose in the tape of the machine gun. We could now get a proper look at the Russian positions, which were a hundred metres away from us. From our hill, located directly opposite the enemy, we could see grey, stained faces. I now wonder myself how it was that the Russians had not captured our hill. However, there were similar hills all around, and it was impossible for the enemy to occupy them all. The field felon pointed out to us something going on to our left, going on. Look! he almost screamed. We cautiously turned around. German soldiers were crawling along the ground. They had broken through the Russian protective wire. 
Everywhere, as far as the eye could see, there were figures sprawled on the ground. Ours, said the veteran. A faint smile appeared on his face. Prepare to fire as soon as the enemy moves, added the field feeble. Suddenly a shiver ran through my body that I couldn't stop. I was not shaking from fear. It was just that now that our task was nearing completion, the fear and tension that I had been holding in until now were coming out. I managed to open the magazine bolt and, with the veteran's help, stuff the machine gun belt into it. To prevent the bolt from clicking, I didn't close it all the way. On the left, a ball worthy of the music of Saint-Saint has begun. It would go on for days. A second later, one of the German soldiers hit the wire attached to the mines. Everything around, the Russian position, the bodies of Gumpers and his enemy, our hillock, and even our hearts, was shaken by explosions that resembled the rolls of thunder. It seemed to us that the crawling soldiers were blown to pieces, but the Hitler youth soldiers, it was they who were crawling in our direction, got up and rushed through the wire. Gals opened fire. The veteran snapped the bolt and leaned the machine gun against his shoulder. Fire! the field sergeant commanded. Wipe them off the face of the earth! The Russians rushed into the trenches. A sliver of 7.7 caliber ammunition ran through my hands with terrible rapidity. The rattle of the machine gun deafened me. Through the haze of gunfire, I could hardly see what was happening. The machine gun was bouncing on the bed and the veteran was shaking with it. His firing put a final end to the battle. In the distance behind us fired from all guns, German artillery, shelling the second line of trenches of the enemy Russians, not expecting an attack, desperately tried to organise a defence, but from everywhere from the darkness jumped out at them young lions. They tore to pieces both soldiers and weapons. The deafening rumble of thousands of explosions could be heard everywhere in the valley. Ahead, behind the Russian positions, the German air force was bombing a fairly large town. Smoke was billowing from the huge fires on the ground at a distance of 50 metres. I tucked a second ribbon into the machine gun magazine. The veteran was firing relentlessly at the living and dead people who had taken refuge in the front trenches of the Soviet troops. Here, in the midst of all this rumbling, we could clearly hear the rumbling of tanks. Ours are coming, the Czech shouted joyfully. Gals and Lindbergh left their position and sprinted toward us. We even thought one of them had been wounded. They got away just in time. A second later, a tank passed over the ground where they had just been lying and crushed the wire with its tracks. The turned earth shook with the explosion of mines that stopped the tanks or showered the infantrymen with shrapnel. A tank, followed by two more, came close to us, heading for the enemy positions we had already been shelling for several minutes. And now the tank is already crossing the trench, which is full of the corpses of Russian soldiers. Through the bloody mess passes the second and then the third tank. To their tracks stuck to the remains of human bodies, from the sight of which our field officer involuntarily cried out. The young soldiers, who had hitherto known only the pleasures of barracks life, realised at last what reality was like. We heard someone screaming in terror, and then there was a victory cry. The first wave of the German offensive continued to advance. More tanks were emerging from the forests behind us. They swept under young trees and bushes and went straight for the infantry units. The infantry men scattered, making way for them. If there were wounded men lying on the ground somewhere, it meant that they were very unlucky. The first stage of the attack was planned to be lightning fast. Nothing should delay the advance of the tanks. We were joined by a detachment of infantry. Their field officer was talking to ours when a tank came straight at us. Everyone scattered. A soldier ran towards the tank. He waved to the tankers to stop, but the tank, like a blinded monster, kept crawling along the ground, passing within a couple of metres of our hill. In my haste, I clutched onto the machine gun bed and stretched out on the opposite side of the hill. The monstrous machine passed along our line of defence. Its tracks were approaching me with threatening rapidity. I don't remember much of what happened next. Only isolated moments pop up in my memory. It's hard to remember what happens when you don't think about anything. 
when you don't try to anticipate or understand anything, when under the steel helmet there is one empty head and a pair of eyes, glazed over like the eyes of an animal facing mortal danger. Explosions are heard in the head, some closer, others farther away, some stronger, others weaker. One hears the screams of maddened people, which then, depending on the outcome of the battle, will be called the screams of heroes or ruthless killers. We hear the groans of the wounded, those who are dying in agony, looking at their mangled bodies, panic cries of soldiers who are running, not knowing the way. Horrifying sights flash in the mind, entrails that stretch from one dead man to another among the ruins, smoking guns that resemble butchered animals, trees fallen to the ground, windows of houses turned to dust. Officers and field officers amidst all this horror are regrouping platoons and companies. This is how I first had to participate in the German offensive north of Belgorod, under orders barely audible because of the noise and dust clouds following the tanks. The resistance of the enemy was broken. Again, everything either fell into German hands or was destroyed. The hordes of Russian soldiers retreated deep into their vast country. I also remember that we captured thousands of prisoners of war. Among them were those who came over to our side and immediately gave our soldiers, who did not care about anything, lists of those who were to be shot first. I remember the Russian trucks in which two or three thousand enemy soldiers took refuge, intent on stopping our advance at all costs, and the machine gun that the veteran and I continuously fed with ammunition, the Gals machine gun, as well as the 10th Company which had been reformed. The soldiers of the 10th Company fired and laughed. They were avenging their fallen comrades. We shelled the enemy tanks with anti-tank shells and heard the cries of the Russians, who no longer dared to move, surrender or go on the offensive. And then everything was consumed by fire. The heat became so intense that we withdrew. By noon, the Soviet troops tried to go on the offensive, they showered new waves of young lions with a hail of shells, but nothing could delay them even for a moment. By the end of the second day, the scorched remains of Belgorod passed into the hands of the victors. Mad with success, we continued the offensive without respite, increasing the wedge we were driving into the Soviet central front. As our so-called information services claimed, we had 150,000 soldiers fighting against us. In reality, it was more like 400,000, 500,000. Their resistance could be broken by 60,000 Germans. By the evening of the third day of continuous fighting, during which we had only been able to keep our eyes closed for half an hour at most, we were completely mad. It seemed to us that we were capable of anything. A Czech and a field felon, who were either dead or wounded and left lying among the ruins, had dropped out of our platoon. Two grenadiers, who had broken away from their units, had joined our ranks. We were now divided into three groups, among them the 11th platoon, in which Olensheim had fought, and the 17th, which had rejoined our ranks. They were commanded by a lieutenant. We were ordered to destroy the pockets of resistance in the ruins of the village. There was still fighting going on there, although the retreating Soviet troops had already abandoned these positions. We were faced with a spectacle that resembled a day of judgment. However, the possibility of falling asleep in a quiet corner occupied us more than a stray Russian bullet. The explosions from the front of the advance shook the air, clogging our weakened lungs. Everyone was silent, only occasionally we heard the commands, Halt! Stand still! And we threw ourselves on the burning ground. We were so tired that we got up only when we had completely suppressed the next pockets of resistance. The soldiers left without reinforcements, huddled in some trench. Sometimes soldiers with their hands up would emerge from their hiding places, those who wanted to surrender. And each time the same tragedy was repeated. Kraus, under the lieutenant's orders, shot four surrenderers, Sudets two and soldiers from the 17th Company nine. Young Lindbergh, who had been in a state of panic-stricken terror since the beginning of the offensive, he was either sobbing or laughing, took a machine gun from Kraus and put down two Bolsheviks. The two killed were much older than the boy and begged for mercy until the last moment. 
For a long time longer, we heard their cries. But Lindbergh, who was seized by a fit of rage, fired until the screams were silenced. I also remember the bread house. We called it that because after we had killed all those who were in it, we found a few loaves of bread and killed them as a reward for the horrors that had befallen us. From fear and fatigue we were maddened. Our nerves were strained to the utmost. We could scarcely obey the orders and shouts of danger that came in uninterrupted succession. We were forbidden to take prisoners. We knew that the Russians did not take prisoners either, so however much we wanted to sleep, we had to keep ourselves half asleep, knowing that somewhere nearby the Bolsheviks were roaming. It was either them or us, which is why both I and my friend Gals threw grenades at the bread house, although the Russians had displayed a white flag there. When our endless onslaught came to an end, we stretched out at the bottom of the funnel and stared at each other for a long time without saying a word. It was as if we were all numb. Our tunics were unbuttoned, torn to shreds, and from the dirt stuck to them merged with the colour of the ground. The air was still rumbling with explosions and the smell of burning. Four more of our men were killed, and we carried with us five or six wounded, among whom was Olensheim. There were twenty of us gathered in the trench. We tried to put our thoughts in order, but our gaze wandered unseeingly over the burned-out surroundings, and our heads were empty. The radio announced that the offensive at Belgorod had succeeded. It was to be the starting point for the further advance of German troops to the east. On the fourth or fifth day, we passed through Belgorod without stopping in the city. The soldiers involved in the offensive were gathering their strength. Countless infantrymen were sleeping on the sides of the road. Soon we were loaded into a truck and brought to a new position. I do not understand what the strategic significance of the dilapidated village was, but it was probably where the next offensive was to begin. The beautiful landscape, gardens of sturdy trees and streams lined with willows, reminded me of Normandy for some reason. Everywhere one could see the defences and assembly points of offensive German units. Among the ruins of the village huts we began to build a position. First of all, we had to get rid of the corpses of 30 Bolsheviks lying among the ruins. We dumped them in a small garden, which had apparently once been carefully tended. The heat was unbearable. We squinted at the bright rays of the sun, and the creases in our faces were even more sharply defined. The light poured also on the faces of the murdered Russians, whose halting pupils were unnaturally dilated. I looked at them, and everything inside me turned upside down. Isn't it amazing, said the Sudeten man calmly, how quickly the beard grows on dead men. Look at that. He turned the corpse over with his foot. There were seven or eight holes in the dead man's shirt and blood caked around them. He must have shaved yesterday just before he was shot. Look at him. He's got a beard that would take a week to grow if he was alive. Look at this one, laughed another soldier. He was clearing a building that had been hit by a heavy mortar shell. The Russian soldier he brought with him had no head. You'd better go and shave yourself, or when it's your turn tomorrow, no one will recognise you. Your nonsense makes me sick. You'd think it was the first time you'd ever seen such a thing. The veteran sat down on a pile of rubble and opened the kettle. We found a basement that made an excellent defensive point and dragged both of our machine guns into it. We dug a vent that had been filled in when the house collapsed and even widened it. For a few minutes we interrupted our work and watched a German airplane fly by. Somewhere nearby, a rain of bombs fell on the Ivanovs. Gals punched a hole in the stone wall, figuring out how best to arrange the loopholes. Lindbergh, who was also involved in the construction of the shelter, rejoiced to the point of madness. Everything that worked in our favour made him terribly excited. All he did was cry with fear and piss his pants. The veteran and I tried to staple the vent, but it wasn't working. Every time we moved, our helmets hit the low ceiling. Behind us, Kraus and two grenadiers were picking up rocks and other debris on the floor. One picked up an empty bottle and, as was his civilian habit, set it against the wall. As I said before, we lost a field sergeant. 
a veteran who had been promoted to the rank of Oberefleutnant, took command of our platoon. But we still obeyed the orders of another fat Feldfabel, who died two days later. This bastard was meticulous in checking our work. He made us finish one thing and another, and did not even know that he had only two days to live. All day long we watched the soldiers walk by, sweat pouring down their backs, and in the distance there were explosions and flares. It was then that our new torment began. As we slowly came to our senses, we began to realise what had happened to us. It suddenly occurred to us that there was no longer any field febble, no gumpers, no check, and no wounded lad left to his fate. We tried to erase from our minds the memories of the Russian trench, which we ourselves had machine-gunned, and of the tanks rolling directly over human bodies, of the village overflowing with Bolshevik corpses, of the bursting shells of enemy artillery in the narrow streets filled with Hitler youth soldiers. We tried to forget everything that frightened and disgusted us. We were suddenly seized with a horror that gave us goosebumps and made our hair stand on end. I could no longer feel the outside world, it was as if I had split in two. I knew I could not bear it, not because I was better than others, but because it should not happen to a young man who lived a normal life like other people. Three grenadiers stood at the stairs. The veteran, alone at the vent through which the sun peered into the room, was fumbling in his pockets and spreading his supplies on the smooth stone. Gals curled up on the bench and was silent, while Lindbergh and Sudetes stared silently into the holes in the wall, though their thoughts were obviously far away from here. I went over to Gals and lay down beside him. For several minutes we stared at each other, unable to utter a word. What the devil do we want here? Gals finally spoke up. His features had hardened since our stay in the Bialystok barracks. I gestured at him, letting him know I didn't know. I'm sleepy, but I can't sleep, he said. Yeah, it's as hot in here as it is outside. Why don't we go for a walk after all? We stepped outside and took a few steps through the sunlit courtyard. Maybe there's cold water there. I pointed to the garden where the stream ran in front of me. I'm not thirsty, and I'm not hungry either, Gals replied to my amazement. I'm used to his voraciousness. Are you sick? No, I'm just sick. I'm tired as hell, and when I look at those guys over there I feel like shit. He nodded at the thirty corpses decomposing in the garden. What can you do? We're not afraid of them now, I said in a tone of voice that still surprised me. Ours were picked up before we got here, Gals continued. There's freshly dug ground in the village. I don't know how many they put in there, and how many we shot. A few minutes passed in silence. Who knows, maybe we'll be replaced soon. Yeah, Gals said. I wish I could. When we shot the Ivans in the bread house, we acted like the last scoundrels. He was clearly having the same thoughts as me. But now the bread house is over, and there's nothing to be done about it, I replied. I can still feel the machine gun ribbons running down my arms. I can see the deadly lead flashing out of the muzzle of the machine gun with each shot, the force of the recoil hurting my face and hands. And in the din of the firing there were desperate cries. Help! Help! Something terrible and disgusting has entered our souls, does not want to come out, and pursues us. The sun was shining brightly, but we had no idea what time it was. Was it still morning or was it already daytime? It didn't matter. We ate and drank when we wanted, slept when we could, and tried to think when we took off the helmet. It's just amazing how a helmet prevents you from thinking. It was still daylight when the rumble of the enemy's barrage broke into the gardens, but it was our troops, who were on the offensive, who suffered first of all. We crawled into the shelter of the cellar and gazed fearfully at the ceiling from which the plaster was falling with every burst. We should have fortified it, the veteran said. If a bomb exploded nearby, we would be buried under the rubble. The shelling continued for at least two hours. A few shells fell close to us, but they were obviously intended for the German troops who were on the offensive. Our guns answered the enemy's fire, and the rumble of artillery shells was so strong that almost nothing else could be heard. 
The Russian howitzers were firing at a distance of only 30 metres. In addition, the shells of our howitzers were flying over us, and the ceiling was no less likely to collapse from them. During the shelling, we felt tremendous tension. We tried to make predictions, but events disproved the predictions we had just made. The veteran anxiously smoked one cigarette after another and repeatedly demanded that we shut up. Kraus huddled in a corner, muttering something to himself, probably praying. In the evening, a platoon that had taken part in the counter-attack visited us. The soldiers had set up an anti-tank gun nearby. A little later, the colonel appeared and inspected the supports we had put up to prevent the roof from collapsing. Well done, said the colonel. He walked around our platoon, offered each of us a cigarette, and then headed for the Great Germany Division, located even closer to the front. It was getting dark. Lights flashed against the broken trees. The battle continued and the tension became unbearable. We had to post a guard outside so none of our group got a good night's sleep. At dawn we were raised and ordered to leave our shelter and move deeper into Soviet territory. The German offensive continued. We saw with our own eyes a whole field of dead Hitler youth soldiers. They had been killed in yesterday's artillery raid. With every step we realised what could happen to our despicable flesh as well. They should have buried them so we wouldn't have to look at it, Gals muttered. Everyone laughed as if he was joking. The area we were walking through was a series of craters. How anyone had survived here was a wonder. Behind the embankment was a field hospital. From the screams and groans coming from it, you would have thought it was a slaughterhouse. What we saw shocked us. I almost fainted and Lindbergh burst into tears. We went behind the fence and stared up at the sky. As if in a dream, young soldiers passed in front of us, their arms torn off, their wounds festering, their intestines sticking out of their bellies, covered by sheets. After passing the hospital, we forded the canal. The water reached our breasts, but its coolness brought us to our senses. On the far bank, the grassy turf was covered with Russian corpses. Black with cinders stood a Russian tank. Behind it, we could see the gun and the bodies of the tankers, who had been blown to pieces. On the left, the battle was boiling with even greater fury. It seemed to us that one of the Russian machine gunners lying on the battlefield groaned. We approached him. One of the soldiers uncorked a flask and lifted his bloody head. The Russian stared at us with wide open eyes in which fear was evident. He cried out and his head fell on the wheel of the gun. The machine gunner was dead. We passed through wooded hills that changed from one to another. Here, in the shade of the trees, troops returning from the front line were regrouping and resting. Many soldiers were bandaged. White bandages stood out sharply against the background of their faces, greyed from dirt and fatigue. Our platoon took roll call and everyone was sent to their designated points. The grenadiers from our platoon were sent to another unit, and two soldiers from disorganised units joined our ranks. Unfortunately, our platoon was led by the field feeble already mentioned. Now he had only one day to live. As ordered, we reached a huge plateau on tanks, stretching into the endless distance. Jumping off the tanks, which had stopped, we found ourselves among the soldiers lying down at the bottom of the trench. Shots from 50mm enemy artillery showed us that here were already forward positions. The tanks turned and disappeared behind the trees 50 metres behind us. We squeezed through the crowd of soldiers crammed into the trench. They did not take our appearance with much enthusiasm. The enemy's artillery was firing at the moving tanks. As they moved into the forest, the sounds of bursts subsided. The dull-faced fieldfelder became worried that a round only do that shooting and began to discuss the situation with the young lieutenant. Soon, the latter signalled to his subordinates. Bending in three figures, they headed into the forest. The Ivans, who were not hidden from what was going on, fired five or six bursts at them. Bullets whistled around us. Once again, we were alone in the trench. There were nine of us, and right in front of us were the Russian positions. The sun was shining brightly in the sky. Enough lazing around, let's get to work. We have to set up the machine gun. 
the field feeble bellowed in a voice that was more suitable for a military review. As ordered, we began to rake the dusty soil of the Ukraine with pickaxes. There was no time to talk. The sun was scorching so hot that I barely had enough strength to work with my hands. They won't even have time to shoot us, said Gals. We'll die of fatigue before they do. My head is splitting, I sighed heavily. But the lieutenant did not want to give us any leeway. He looked anxiously into the distance. As far as the eye could see, there was a desert without a blade of grass. As soon as we set up the machine gun, we heard the rumble of tanks which made us shiver. On this perfect day, the tanks appeared out of nowhere. They were heading eastward. Behind them, bent, hidden by clouds of dust, were German soldiers. In about five minutes, the Russians began a fierce shelling. Everything around was covered with smoke. The sun was not visible behind the flashes of fire. Barely visible behind the cloud of dust, in the distance, 80 to 100 metres away, flickered flashes. Never before had I seen the ground crack like that. The shelling had started a fire in the forest. We were ready to scream with terror, but our throats were dry and we could not make a sound. Everything flew into tatters. Shell fragments and sparks of fire flew through the air. The first shaft swallowed Kraus and the new soldiers before they could realise it. I huddled in the farthest corner of the trench and watched with mad eyes as the tornado moved toward us. Mad with fear, I howled. Gals's head jammed into mine. Our helmets bumped against each other as if two pans had collided. My friend's face was contorted with horror. We're screwed, he croaked. His words were overlaid by a rumble of explosions that was breathtaking. Suddenly someone fell into our trench as if from the sky. Then someone else's body fell. It was two recruits from our platoon. Gasping, one of them shouted, Our whole company is dead! He cautiously poked his head out, and at the same moment there were several explosions that blew off the soldier's helmet, and with it part of his skull, which fell into Gals's hands. We were both covered with blood and human flesh. With all his might, Gals kicked the bloody brains away and buried his face in the dirt. The explosions were so strong that we thought it was an earthquake. Then there was a powerful flash at the bottom of the trench. One of the machine guns fell on us from above together with the ground. Those who were still able to move their lips out of fear shouted, We're screwed. Mommy, no, no, we'll be buried alive. Help. But no words could stop the hurricane that was bearing down on us. About thirty more soldiers piled into the trench. They did not hesitate to shove us around. Everyone wanted to get in deeper. There was no chance of survival for those who remained outside. The whole ground was covered with shell craters. We could hear the stomping of soldiers running for cover. But the shelling did not stop, and those who had already thought they had escaped were dying. There was a roar of fighter planes. We shouted, Hurrah! to the Luftwaffe pilots. A few seconds pass it and the shelling stopped. The surviving officers signalled retreat. The soldiers began to crawl out of the trench like rabbits from a hole, chased by a boa constrictor. We were about to climb in, but then a roar came from a field sergeant. He was still alive. Where are you going? We must stop the Russian counterattack. Prepare the machine gun for battle. At the bottom of the trench, which was now unrecognisable, lay six corpses of Hitler Youth soldiers. Krause's boots were sticking out of the hole formed on the left, and the grenadier was completely buried. With the help of a veteran whose face was covered with blood, we managed to put the machine gun back in place. The terrain in front of us had changed beyond recognition. We could see holes everywhere, as if a powerful excavator had worked here. Everywhere we saw the same picture. Smoke, flames, corpses. In the distance, through the veil of dust and smoke, peeped geysers of fire. It was our Messerschmitts dropped bombs on the Russian artillery. It seems that they set fire to the ammunition depots. The explosions shook the air with terrible force, and everything around was on fire. Bastards, shouted the sergeant. Finally they got what they deserved. Our fighters turned westward, and the Russian artillery opened fire again. The main target was the tanks. They retreated haphazardly.
a third of them destroyed. When the frantic soldiers burst into our trench, they almost broke my arm, but I felt nothing at that moment. Now I felt a brutal pain that would not go away. But I had enough to do, so my health was not too bad. The shelling continued to the north and south. Then the hurricane swept over us again, sowing pain and terror. The soldiers of our platoon were breathing with such difficulty as an invalid who had just recovered and suddenly realised that he had no strength left to live at all. We lost the gift of speech. We could not find words to express what we felt. In the souls of those who have gone through what we have gone through, there remains forever an underlying fear that a person is unable to cope with. As the years go by, this fear only grows stronger, and there is nothing that can be done about it. Even I, when I try to express what I have experienced, cannot talk about it. In a daze forgotten by the God in whom many of us believed, we lay in a trench that now resembled a tomb. From time to time someone would look out to see if death was coming at us from the north, from the sandy desert. We had lost our bearings in life. We had forgotten that people were not created only for war, that life goes on, that there is hope and other human feelings besides fear, that sometimes there is real friendship, that a person can even fall in love, that it is possible not only to bury the dead in the earth, but also to grow bread. Also, we lost the ability to think, moving without a single thought in our heads. From being in a trench full of soldiers, our arms and legs had outgrown their obedience. Too much energy was expended in pushing our neighbours dead and alive. The felled feeble kept repeating that we must hold our position, but each new rupture drove us deeper into the bottom of the trench. Before we realised that the day had passed and night had come, with it came back our fear. Lindbergh was completely out of his senses. He fell into a stupor and paid no attention to anything. Sudetz's condition was little better. He began to tick, vomiting which could not be stopped. Our whole platoon went into a frenzy. Being in an almost unconscious state, I saw the giant, whom in ordinary times I knew by the name of Gals, sneak to the machine gun to open a palm in the air. The felled feeble pounded the ground with his clenched fist in fury, then attacked one of the surviving grenadiers. He still had some presence of mind, but after the incident he stared at the field sergeant in a trance and burst into tears. I realised that I was about to faint, stood and shouted curses. I was exhausted from rage, my head was spinning and I fell to the edge of the trench. My open mouth was filled with mud. I felt nauseous. I knew that the vomiting would not stop until my stomach cleared. Nauseous, I fumbled for support with my hands. Suddenly, as in a nightmare, a bright flame flared up in the darkness around us. I had a strange feeling that I was at home, that I was imagining things, and that the flames coming down on us were just a shooting star. My comrades stood without changing their posture. It was as if they had fallen asleep with their ears open. By midnight, the shelling had stopped it, but no one even moved. We were so exhausted that any movement seemed like torture. Only the veteran was able to reach our consciousness. Guys, it's no time to sleep. The Ivans are about to attack. The field fable looked at him apprehensively. He stood up and leaned against the wall of the trench. After a few moments, his head drooped. He had fallen into a nervous sleep. The veteran tried to bring us to our senses, but the six survivors paid no attention to him. We could not be defeated by gunfire but sleep overcame the fighters. Had the Russians gone on the attack at this point, they would have saved the lives of many of their soldiers. The German soldiers who were tasked with preventing the enemy from advancing were either asleep or killed. Although the large caliber guns were still firing and there were many flashes, for four hours we were completely disconnected from what was happening. The first to wake up was the field officer. When we opened our eyes, we saw that he was leaning over the Sudeten who was sleeping next to him. In his sleep, the Sudets shrieked, and apparently this shriek woke up the lieutenant. Our exhaustion was so great that every movement was painful. The sky turned pink. At the first rays of the sun, the dead valley again appeared to our eyes. We gazed at the vast expanse that opened before us. We got some supplies and tried to make conversation. Well done. We need a refreshment. 
joked the field officer. I don't think it's going to be this quiet from now on. Maybe it will, someone said. Who knows how long the fight might take? I don't think so, objected the field fleeble. The Fuhrer has given the order to move eastward. Now nothing and no one can stop our troops. As soon as it dawns, we will start the offensive. Are you sure about this? Lindbergh, hearing that our side is winning, became excited. Our troops will finish off the Russians? If it gets messy again, Gals whispered in my ear, I'm going to go crazy. Or die, I replied. I don't think we'll be so lucky today. Gals stared at me, yawning unceasingly. Feldfeebel, Lindbergh and the Grenadier continued to talk, while Gals and I exchanged pessimistic forecasts. Only the veteran was silent. With eyes reddened from sleeplessness, he looked at the morning star. You two, Field Flebel addressed Gals and me, will keep a close eye on the situation and the rest of us will sleep for a couple of hours. But first we must get rid of the dead. He pointed to eight mutilated corpses, which were already stinking. We watched the plaques being removed from the dead. At least we didn't have to be undertakers. We'd rather be on guard duty. I guess the survivors are always hurling the same profanity at the dead. Holy shit, this guy weighs a ton. Oh my God, I wish they'd just shot him. Look what happened to him. Finally, there is a metallic sound. The plaques have been removed. Bah, he's drowning in shit. We are indifferent to what is happening. Death has lost its flavour of drama for us. We are used to it. While the soldiers deal with the corpses, Gals and I discuss our chances of staying alive. My arms and legs hurt, but nothing serious. I wonder what's up with Olensheim. Looks like a broken arm. How's your arm? My shoulder hurts like hell. And behind us, the rest of the soldiers were sweating on the dirty work, exchanging impressions. Heinz Feller, born 1925, single. Poor guy. Let me see what's wrong with your shoulder, said Gals. I wonder if you're badly wounded. I don't think so. Just a scratch. I unbuckled my belt. I was about to expose my shoulder when a rumble rumbled through the morning air. A moment later, Russian shells whistled around us. We huddled again in terror at the bottom of the trench. Jesus, someone shouted. Here we go again. Gals was coming toward me, scrambling between the falling rocks. He said something, but his voice was drowned out by the rumble of the rupture. We can't hold out, he said. We have to get out of here. A shell fell very close to us and its bursting made everything around us burst into flames. We were enveloped in thick smoke, and tons of earth fell into the trench. We heard frightened shouts, and then the voice of a staff felled feeble. No one got hurt? God, wheezed the veteran. Why is our artillery silent? Lindbergh trembled again, and then the firing stopped. The veteran cautiously leaned out. Seven more heads followed. The dust had not yet settled in the plain. That means we're out of shells, the field officer grinned. Otherwise they would never have stopped. The veteran looked at him, as usual, with an absent look. I thought we were out of shells. Otherwise, why didn't our artillery fire? We're preparing for an offensive, so the guns are silent. Wait, our tanks will soon appear. The veteran did not take his eyes off the horizon. I have no doubt, continued to rant Field Feeble, any minute the German troops will go on the offensive. But we were no longer listening to him. Our eyes were fixed on the veteran. His pupils dilated and he opened his mouth as if he were going to scream. The Field Feeble finally fell silent. We all looked where the veteran was looking. In the distance, a black streak stretched across the horizon. It came like a wave against the shore. For a few moments, we could not take our eyes off the terrible picture. The troops were marching in solid rows, which seemed unreal. The veteran's cry made our souls ache. Siberians! Siberians are coming to us! There are a million of them! He grabbed the machine gun and laughed through his teeth. In the distance, like a hurricane, 
came the roar of a thousand throats. Hurrah! Take your places, ordered the field fable. He looked at the approaching enemy troops as if mesmerised. We took up our rifles and machine guns and leaned against the trench embankment. Gals was trembling, and his partner, Lindbergh, could not control the machine gun belt. Come here, quick, Gals shouted. Come here or I'll shoot you. Lindbergh's face twitched. He was ready to cry. The veteran didn't scream anymore. He rested the machine gun on his shoulder, pulled the trigger and clenched his teeth with all his might. The screams of the Soviet soldiers grew louder and louder, and their rumblings did not subside for a long time. Frozen with terror, we could not even realise how great the enemy's power was. Like a mouse frozen at the sight of a snake, we were paralysed by fear. Lindbergh broke down. He cried and screamed, then threw himself to the bottom of the trench. They're gonna kill us, they're gonna kill us, they're gonna kill us all. Get up, shouted the field sergeant. Get back to your post, or I'll kill you myself. He lifted Lindbergh to his feet with force, but he slid to the ground again with a sob. Scoundrel, shouted Gals. To hell with you, die, I can do without you. The shouts of the Russians were heard quite distinctly, and again the mighty hurrah was heard. Mommy, I thought. Mommy. Hooray! Hurrah! Victory! The veteran mocked the Russians. Just come here. The mass of soldiers was only a hundred metres away from us. Then we heard the roar of engines. Three airplanes appeared in the morning sky. Bombers! shouted the Sudeten man. But we saw them without him. We tore our gaze away from the horde of Russians. The planes, without slowing down, were descending on the soldiers. Messerschmitts! shouted the field flabel. Wow! Yay! we shouted. Long live the Luftwaffe! Three airplanes hovered over the Russian army and poured deadly fire on it. The bombardment from the sky served as a signal to our cannons hidden in the forest. They too opened fire on the enemy. The machine guns that survived during the bombardment also rumbled. Airplanes flew directly over the heads of the advancing and inspired in our soldiers the will to victory. Through my hands ran a machine gun tape. One ran out and we refuelled the second. Opened fire and large calibre guns of the Wehrmacht. They dealt a fatal blow to the Bolsheviks, who were marching into the attack like in Napoleon's time. But the Russian soldiers kept moving. But now death no longer frightened us. I did not take my eyes off the glowing muzzle of the machine gun held by the veteran. Prepare grenades! ordered the field officer, who was firing a Luger from his left shoulder. It's no use, the veteran shouted even louder. We don't have enough ammunition, we can't stop them. Feldfebel, give the order to retreat before it's too late. We shifted our gaze from the field feeble to the veteran. The shouts of the Russians became louder and louder. Hooray! They fired from the hip, right on the run. Bullets whistled around them. You're crazy, said the field officer. You can't leave here. Our troops will appear any minute. So, for God's sake, keep firing. Don't stop. The veteran loaded the last magazine. You're crazy. Any minute now. Go to hell. Stay here. Die if you want. Come back, yelled the field officer. The veteran got out of the trench and, ducking as low as possible, rushed with all his legs into the forest. Without stopping, he shouted, Follow me! We grabbed our weapons in a hurry. Run! shouted the Sudetenite, and the whole platoon ran after him. We were mad with fear. We ran headlong, panting towards the thickets. Russian bullets were whistling all around. Strange as it may seem, all seven of us ran. The field sergeant, without stopping to shout curses, was next to us. Bastards! Shoot back! You'll be killed! It's better to die fighting! But we didn't stop. Halt! yelled the fieldfelder. Stop, pigs! We approached the veteran, who stopped to catch his breath by a bruised tree. You bastard! The fieldfelder wouldn't stop. Well, I'll report you. 
I don't care, the veteran laughed in his face. Better a punishment than a Russian bayonet. We ran again. We started climbing up the hill. The shells had ripped out all the trees. Hurry up, shouted the veteran, hearing the Russian bullets whistling around him. Hurry up, feel feeble. Why are you stuck? He shouted to our commander. You'll see, as soon as we get to our own, we'll give the Russians a sniff of gunpowder. The veteran didn't have time to finish. The field fleeble shrieked and froze, waving his arms comically, then rolled down the slide and remained lying on the ground. Asshole, the veteran swore. I told him not to hesitate. Our squad, having lost its commander for the second time, continued to trudge through the thicket, bending under the weight of our weapons. Let's take a break, I suggested. I can hardly breathe. Gals lowered himself to the ground. Behind us we could hear the rumble of guns and the whistle of German shells fired toward the enemy. This will not stop, Ivan, said the veteran. Don't they understand? Guys, don't stop. Now is not the time to relax. Thank God you were with us, Gals thanked the veteran. Otherwise we would have been finished. That's for sure. Well, that's it. We're rested. We're on our way. We ran again, though I was tired and out of breath. Three more infantrymen joined us. Well, you scared us, said one of them. We thought you were Bolsheviks. We came to a small clearing. Here was a bombed-out field storehouse, which had been hit by a Russian shell yesterday. Between the branches of a fallen tree lay a blackened corpse. Suddenly a whole company of soldiers surrounded us, ready to rush to the attack. A tall lieutenant came out to meet us. Where is the field fielder? He asked, wasting no time in ceremony. Dead, the veteran replied, standing at attention. Damn it, where are you from? What company? Eighth Platoon, Fifth Company. Interdiction Troops, Great Germany Division, Mr. Lieutenant. 21st Platoon, 3rd Company, said the three soldiers who had just joined our ranks. We're the only ones left alive. The officer glanced at us, but kept silent. The rattle of the guns and the shouts of the Siberians could be heard. Where is the enemy? The Lieutenant asked. In front of you, Mr. Lieutenant. Everywhere in the valley, there are thousands of them. Continue the digression. We are not part of Greater Germany. When you meet one of your regiments, join it. There was no need to repeat the order. We returned to the woods, and the officer went up to the soldiers and gave them some orders. In this way, we passed many units ready to attack. At last we arrived at a village in which a defensive post had been set up shortly before. Here we stopped. There was a detachment from our division in the village, but nobody knew about the 5th Company. First the officer and then the soldiers threw a lot of questions at us. But they allowed us to rest under the roof and even brought us a drink. Everywhere the work was boiling. Soldiers were building defensive fortifications and engaged in camouflage. By noon the Russian artillery opened fire again. We rushed into the familiar cellar. There, in spite of the explosions which shook the ground, a fat man, a veteran of the Great Germany, was singing and dancing. The people present did not pay the slightest attention to him. Are you out of your mind? Gals stopped in bewilderment. He was already freaking out when we got here, someone explained. Soon we stopped looking at the crazy fat guy. Now he was doing the French can-can. That's too much, Gals muttered but the crazy soldier only waved his hands. Toward evening, five or six tanks came toward the Russians, followed by several companies of grenadiers. From afar came the sounds of battle, which did not subside for an hour. Then the grenadiers returned, followed by soldiers of disorganized units. The trees were colored with flashes of flame. Bullets whistled around. The retreating soldiers dragged their wounded comrades behind them. We realised that we would soon be on the front line again. The fighting was getting closer. The explosions were getting louder. Their rumbling made us feel terrified again. The counter-attacks of the regiments we were passing by were smothered in the vast Russian mass, 
unafraid of casualties. Our village had become an important strategic point. It was full of machine guns, mortars and even anti-tank guns. It was to this that we owed what we had to endure for the next day and a half. At a distance of 60 metres were sheltered two machine guns, at which stood Gals and the veteran. To our right, under cover of the ruins, a mortar was placed ready for battle. The rest of the soldiers had rifles, machine guns, grenade launchers. They were all hiding behind the ruins of five or six huts, behind firewood or hedges. A little farther away, behind a low wall, soldiers from the retreating units were placed. They were regrouped and forced to dig new trenches. To the left, behind a house that had survived, was a platoon of mortarmen, which had also been augmented by disorganised squads of infantrymen. A little way back over the road that ran through the village stood a 50mm anti-tank gun protected by a sort of bunker. Its muzzle was aimed at the gardens. Behind it, a little lower down, next to a tractor, radio communication trucks stopped. From the shelter in the basement, orders were constantly pouring in. The officers were hastily regrouping the retreating soldiers and creating special purpose units from them. Thus expanding the line of defence of the village, where, obviously, the command post was located. Occasional bullets forced one or the other squad to throw themselves to the ground. But this was nothing compared with what we had experienced yesterday. Now it seemed to us that we were at rest. Only in the distance, at a distance of two kilometres, the fighting between the last detachments of the retreating German troops and the Russian army did not cease. The veteran, who had been listening to the rumblings coming from front and back, nodded. It seems, he repeated, that they have got it into their heads to organise another Siegfried line. Do these fools really think they can stop the Russians that way? You priest, he turned to the priest, maybe pray to God to send lightning. It would come in handy, for artillery is of little use. There was laughter. The priest also laughed. He had seen with his own eyes how God's creatures tore each other to pieces without the slightest remorse, and he was no longer so sure of what he had preached. A paramedic peered into the shelter. What the hell kind of gathering is this? Interdiction squad. Number 8, 5th Company, Field Sergeant, the veteran reported, referring to the six soldiers. The others had asked to visit. All right, the field officer relented. Stay where you are. Let the outsiders go to their positions. We have plenty of empty trenches. The strangers, grumbling, began to rise. Feldfeeble, the veteran turned to him. Leave us some reserves in case any of our men die. We need to hold our positions. All right. The field feeble had not yet had time to make a decision before a crazed fat man appeared in front of him. At Moscow, I served as a machine gunner, Herr Field Feeble. All right, then you and that guy stay here. The rest of you, follow me. So we had a fat man, whom we nicknamed French Can Can, and a scrawny looking soldier. I apologize, Can Can said to us. I hope you're not too angry at me for imposing on you. The thing is, it's not easy to dig a trench that I can fit in. Can Can never closed his mouth for a second. He would say the first thing that came into his head. Only ruptures silenced him, but as soon as the danger was over, he began to speak again. There's plenty of room in the ground for you, the veteran said without a smile. A few boulders on your belly, bloated with beer, and you're done. I'm not much of a beer drinker, French Can Can said, puzzled. He was interrupted by gals. It's like hell outside, he said. Look, there are two of our tanks coming back. Ours, keep your pocket wide open, the veteran grinned. It's a T-34. I hope the guys from the anti-tank brigade spotted them. We fixed our eyes on the monsters that were moving right at us. We can only trust in God, said gals. We can't do anything with our machine guns. Think but he still opened fire with a large calibre machine gun. It was as if a hail of stones had fallen on the tanks. The gun turrets showed flashes, but no other damage was visible. The cannons of the tanks rotated like trunks. The explosion threw us to the floor. A Russian shell whistled above us. It exploded somewhere behind the village. 
the tanks slowed down. One of them started to turn around. Our mortar began firing continuously at the tanks. They backed up. Another Russian shell hit the left wall of the building. The basement was shaking. There were several more explosions, but we did not venture outside anymore. Then came a shout of victory, and we saw one of the tanks hit by a shell from the anti-tank guns. The tank slowly retreated, zigzagging with one track. It crashed into another tank, which staggered from the impact and flanked our mortar. In a few minutes, shrouded in a thick cloud of smoke, he was gone, and with him the other tank retreated. Black smoke was billowing from the first one. It was clear that he would not be able to get far. We heard the victory shouts of the Germans. We've seen it, exclaimed the veteran. That's how you can turn an Ivan into a fugitive. All of us, except the skinny, dark-haired guy, laughed. Why are you so gloomy? Gals asked him. I'm sick, the man replied. You mean scared to death? said the Sudeten man. But we're all scared. Naturally, I'm afraid, but I'm also sick. I bleed when I defecate. So you should go to the hospital, the veteran remarked. I've been trying to get in, but the Major doesn't believe me. He can't see what's wrong with me. Yeah, it'd be easier if you got your arm blown off or your skull bashed in. Try to sleep, said the veteran. We can do without you for now. A field kitchen arrived in the village. Those who had the courage to go outside were given a pot to fill. The mere fact that we were being fed gave us confidence. We were not completely cut off from the world after all. But as night fell, our fear returned. The fighting resumed with renewed vigour. Pressed by the Russian forces, the remnants of the German army were retreating. The Russians had time to appear before the last of our infantrymen had withdrawn. Everywhere against the background of the gardens could be seen groups of advancing soldiers. They ran toward us with shouts, but their voices were drowned in the rumble of the guns. A bloody massacre had begun. The air in the basement was filled with the smoke of two machine guns. It became completely impossible to breathe. More and more cracks appeared in the ceiling from the firing of the anti-tank guns, which were red hot. The plaster was raining down on our heads. We'll take turns firing, the veteran shouted to Gals. Otherwise the machine guns will melt. Lindbergh's face turned greyer than his overcoat. He plugged his ears with mud so he couldn't hear anything. The fifth machine gun belt was going through my wounded fingers. The machine gun was red hot, but the veteran kept firing. Gals's machine gun was blown away by a grenade. The veteran, however, continued firing, sowing death in the ranks of the Russians, who were advancing in a terrifying defile. Despite the enemy's desperate attempts to make a breakthrough, Thousands of Russian soldiers were dying under the fire of German mortars and machine guns. What was happening outside our field of vision, we had no idea. Right in front of us, however, the enemy was suffering terrible losses. Several shrapnel fragments flew through a crack in the wall. By some miracle, everyone was unharmed. Then there was a tremendous rumbling sound. The enemy soldiers threw themselves to the ground, in the darkness, hundreds of flashes illuminated the living and the dead, and then there was a scream. Our artillery! Thank God, said the veteran. I had given up all hope. Well, guys, this time we stood our ground. The Ivans won't get through. The Wehrmacht units regrouped and poured deadly fire on the enemy. There was a look of hope on our faces. That's our way, yelled Kanken. Look what's happening to the Russians. That's what they deserve. Bravo. The ground in front of us was exploding into the air. Lindbergh, mad with joy, shouted at the top of his voice, Sieg Heil! Like us the day before, the Russians could not resist the gunfire. The guns shifted their fire to the distant Russian positions. There were death cries everywhere. We thought the village was saved. Let's have a drink, the veteran suggested. We have something to celebrate. I haven't seen such carnage since I came to Russia. Now we can breathe easier. You. He glanced at Lindbergh. He reluctantly came out of his corner. Instead of blubbering, 
go get us a drink. It was clear that Lindbergh finally lost his mind. He was laughing and crying. Let's go. Gals is sick of Lindbergh. Go get us a drink. He kicked his ass. Lindbergh, clutching his head, came to his senses. But where will I find the booze? He asked. That's up to you. Radio operators always have something stashed away. Or something. Just don't come back empty-handed. Outside, our soldiers were also celebrating the retreat of Ivan's army of many thousands, and our basement became merry. The Kankan danced again, and we followed suit. I thought we were dead. Thank God the artillerymen saved us. Thank God, that's for sure, laughed the grenadier who had been with us for three days. Tears of joy and relief streamed from our reddened eyes down our faces, black with soot. We all trusted the veteran now. He had saved us that morning. Now he was celebrating so we could follow his example. He knows what to expect from the Russians, how many battles he had to go through. But this time the veteran was wrong. The ranks of the Russians were getting denser and denser. These were no longer the divisions that we easily drove out of Poland and chased thousands of kilometres across Russia. Outside far away from the cellar, the villagey and the trenches surrounding it, from the thousands of corpses of muzhiks and burning forests, trampling with their feet the dead Germans and their own, a new Russian army was entering the battle. Now it was more powerful than ever before. The Russian soldiers had hundreds, thousands of guns at their disposal. Soon our laughter would be silent. It would be replaced by the victorious shouts of the Russians. Five pairs of frightened eyes stared at the garden, illuminated by thousands of lights. The Soviets had been trying to break through the German defences for three days, and for three days we had been desperately repulsing the Russian offensive. In between attacks, the Russians were firing on the infantry and artillery from the most powerful guns. Our artillery, as best it could, was firing at the enemy. Five hours had already passed since our laughter had fallen silent. Stalin's units were inexorably crashing into our positions. Those who, like us, were lucky enough to find a good shelter, were shooting the rest of the ammunition in disorder. In the ceiling we had holes, through them, like through a pipe. Smoke was coming out. At the machine gun gals was replaced by a lanky fellow suffering from dyscheria. A bullet or a piece of shrapnel had hit gals. He was huddled next to three dying men who had been brought to our shelter to let them die in peace. Gals' machine gun fired its last shots and fell sea lent, leaving only the veteran, who could barely stand on his feet, to fire. He was assisted by Kankan, Sudets and myself. When Russian Katyusha rockets covered the trench with the mortars, we were seized with despair. The last mortar had been removed and the anti-tank guns had long since fallen silent. Only a few machine guns and infantrymen kept the screaming mob from overrunning the village. At any moment we could have been surrounded and crushed. I guess it's time to die, the veteran said. It sucks, but what can I do? At times, between the flashes, we could distinguish the clatter of machine guns that continued their heroic resistance. The Russians did not retreat. As soon as it dawned, they launched their tanks, killed those who were still defending. A shell destroyed our shelter. We threw ourselves to the floor. Our screams merged with the groans of the machine gunners and the rumble of the Russian tanks trampling the remains of the two machine gunners into the ground. For a full minute, Gals could not take his eyes off the sight before him. He was the only one who had a clear view of what had happened. Later, he told us that the tanks were still tamping the ground for a long time, mixing soil and human remains. The tankers were shouting, Hitler kaput! We managed to retreat about ten minutes before the Russian troops approached. There was no doubt. The army had abandoned us to our fate. God only knows how we got through the mountains of dead men. The flashes. The chaos. My head was shattered by the rumble of shells. The mere thought of silence seemed unimaginable. Behind me was Gals. His hands were stained with blood oozing from the wound in his neck. Lindbergh was silent. He walked in front. The veteran moved behind. He was cursing the war, our artillery men and the Russians with his last words. 
A fat man was walking side by side with me. He was muttering something under his breath. The noise of the battle intensified and the sun rose even higher. We rushed to escape. Saya, we're screwed! Gals shouted to me, panting. There's no use running. My head was splitting from the rumble of shells. Suddenly, Kan Kan screamed. I turned my head and looked at him with unseeing eyes. I thought I was dreaming. I looked at him without feeling the slightest sensation and still could barely move my legs. Don't let me fall, Kan Kan begged. He put his hands around his stomach as if he were holding something. It smelled like the stench of slaughterhouse chow. Hold on, I shouted, not realising what I was doing. Kan Kan shrieked again and bent double. Come on, said the Sudetan man loudly. We are powerless to help him. We kept running, but we looked like some kind of sleepwalkers. The sound of an engine came from behind us. We turned around expecting a new danger. Something dark was approaching us. The headlights were off. With the last of our strength, we ran away. The half-tracked vehicle, as it approached us, was illuminated by the flashes of explosions. Get in, guys. They offered us fraternal help. We stumbled and scrambled toward the truck. It turned out to be the one in front of our shelter in the village. Three soldiers managed to start it. We climbed onto a narrow platform, part of which was occupied by a heavy gun that had been removed from its position. The engine whined and we rolled across the field. There used to be a lot of guns here. Now only empty ammunition boxes remained. Soldiers waved at us. Save yourselves, shouted our driver to them. Ivan is already close by. One of the artillery tractors must have blinded our chauffeur. Anyway, we drove into a deep crater. Everyone who was in the car was thrown out. I was lying at the front wheel of the truck and moaning from the pain in my shoulder. What the hell? Someone swore. What have you done? Fuck you! The driver growled back. I think I broke my knee. I rose to my feet. My left arm was numb. There's blood all over your face, the Sudeten said, glancing at me. But it's only my shoulder that hurts. The body of Gals was on the ground. He was already wounded, and now he had been thrown a long distance away. Maybe he had lost consciousness. Maybe he was dead. I shook him, said his name. His hand went up to his neck. Thank God he's alive. The attempt to pull the car out of the hole was unsuccessful. The wheels just idled helplessly. We had to walk to the next artillery position, where the soldiers were collecting their junk. Together with it, they loaded us into the car. We set off again. In the distance, the horizon was scarlet. Did you get out of that hell? One of the artillerymen turned to the veteran. He did not answer. He was in a deep sleep, in which the pain was not so much felt. A few minutes passed, and almost all our companions fell into sleep despite the shaking. Only Gals and I barely dozed. I could not move from the terrible pain in my shoulder. A figure was leaning over me. My face was covered with blood. The shards of the windshield had bruised me so badly that blood seemed to be oozing from a deep wound. The boy is finished, the figure said. Say more, I shouted. A little later we were given first aid. Every jolt made the pain in my shoulder unbearable. My stomach was turning over. I felt nauseous. Two soldiers led me into the house. Here the wounded were spread out on the floor. Gals came with me. His neck was bloody. The driver came out limping on one leg. Do you feel lousy at all? Gals asked. Sayer, you're not going to die, are you? His words were drowned out by the groans of the wounded. I want to go home, I said, holding back vomit. Me too, Gals answered. He rolled over onto his back and fell asleep. A little later, we were awakened by the orderlies who had come to sort the dead from the wounded. Cold fingers opened my eyelids. Someone was digging their fingers into my eyes. Quiet, boy, said the orderly. Where does it hurt? My shoulder. I can't move my arm. The orderly undid the straps. I howled in pain. No visible damage, Mr. Major. He informed the tall man in the cap. What about your head? It's all right, the orderly replied. There's blood on his face, that's all. There's something wrong with his shoulder. 
The orderly moved my arm and I cried out in pain again. The major nodded. The orderly pinned the note to me, then did the same with Gals and the driver. He took him to the hospital, which was filled to capacity. Gals and I were left lying on the floor. Toward noon, two more orderlies showed up. They took care of those who had been left waiting. With their help, I got up. Nothing, I said. I can walk. Only my shoulder hurt. The orderlies rounded up everyone who could move their legs and sent them to the hospital. Everyone undress? As soon as we opened the door, the field sergeant shouted. When I undressed, I almost fainted from the terrible pain. Two soldiers helped me. Finally, they managed to remove the uniform from my shoulder, which was already swollen. I was given an injection in my thigh. Then the orderlies washed our wounds and put band-aids on them. Behind a closed door, a soldier's scar was being sewn up. His wound stretched across his back. After each touch of the instruments, there was a scream. Two orderlies came in and grabbed my shoulder. I howled in pain and cursed, but they didn't even turn toward me. There was a crunch, and pain shot through my body from head to toe. The orderlies fixed my dislocation and moved on. I met Gals outside. He had a gauze bandage. His whole neck was wrapped in bandages. A piece of metal had hit him about eight centimetres below the first wound he had received near Kharkov. Next time it'll hit you right in the head, Gals said. A little farther on, we found a veteran, a Sudetz, a Lindbergh and a Grenadier. They were asleep, stretched out on the grass. We lay down beside them and soon fell into slumber. Thus ended the battle for Belgorod. The German troops lost the land, with huge losses captured ten days earlier and gave up many other territories. A third of the soldiers fell on the battlefield. Among them were many Hitler youth soldiers. What happened to the young handsome man with the Madonna's face, to his friend who had pure eyes and to the eloquent student? Perhaps they went down on Russian soil, like the accordionist who sang about wanting to return to the peaceful green valley only to die. There are no tombstones over the remains of Germans who died in Russia. One day some man will follow the remains, cover them with fertiliser and sow the arable land with sunflowers.